I'm going to invite you to go ahead and grab a seat, and we're going to get started. Get started on the equipping hour here. We're, we are in the middle of a, a series on James 3 and 4, and um, this has been such an incredible portion of Scripture uh, for me personally, just studying it, and I'm um, looking forward to, to diving in with all of you. If you were uh, not here last week, we, we covered verses 1 through 12 of James chapter 3. That's that incredible section. It's incredibly rich, talking about the, the tongue. And um, this morning, we're going to look at verses 13 through 18, that incredible section, talking about the, the kind of wisdom that is demonstrated by the life. And so let's just begin with a word of prayer. Lord, thank you so much for these equipping hours where we get to gather and just think about your word in, in, in such a way that we, we long to uh, benefit from it by applying it and especially being equipped. This text, Lord, I, I do pray would equip us for the sake of recognizing true saving faith. I pray that it would give us great discernment. First and foremost, discernment about our own heart, about the state of our own faith, and then secondly, discernment so that we would be a benefit to others who profess or don't profess to believe. I pray that it would give us discernment about what, what is true of faith and what is true of your spirit when your spirit takes up residence in a life. You, you tell us, Lord, that you are jealous for our whole spirit and we long to live a life that would demonstrate your wisdom a truly uh, divine, uh, blood-bought, graciously given wisdom, the kind of wisdom that we don't have naturally, the kind of wisdom that must be given to us. Uh, and I pray that that would characterize all of your children because inevitably, Lord, that's what we see here. We see, we see a, a wisdom on display in one's life. And so I pray that as we look at this text, it would give us clarity and even if it shows us, Lord, that we are truly walking with you and that our lives are truly um, full of a fruitful faith, that we would still even benefit by the, the seeing what might be common by, by way of uh, areas of unbelief or any area of carnality or any area of disobedience that would produce and show forth a wisdom where we might be in some area of our Christian walk even, walking with wisdom from below. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would give us incredible discernment this morning simply for the purpose of being equipped, of seeing saving faith rightly, and being able to glorify and honor you. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning I want to I begin with two questions that I want you to answer kind of privately to yourself. So this is not an answer, you know, I don't expect you to yell out an answer, you don't have to, you know... Uh, you know, write it down. But I do want you to think about these two questions. And I'm going to read them both to you and then just repeat them. And I, as, as you hear these questions, you need to come up with an answer in your mind. And as I ask these two questions, I want you to compare, uh, contrast, and, and even consider um, the difference between these two questions. Okay? So I know it's really early and it's already class. Here's your two questions. Okay? Ready? Number one. What wisdom do you possess? What wisdom do you possess? And uh, I could maybe expand it by adding the word, what kind of wisdom do you possess? The second question, what kind of wisdom do you demonstrate? What kind of wisdom do you demonstrate? Okay, so these are... As, you, as, I, as I read these questions, I want to read them one more time. Think about co the comparison, the, the contrast, the distinction between these two questions. Number one, what kind of wisdom do you possess? And then number two, what kind of wisdom do you demonstrate? As I was studying this passage this week, uh, I thought really the, 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 the hypothetical difference between those two questions is so critical. 
if, if we understand the passage that we're about to dive into, we're going to learn that uh, the difference between these two questions is, is that there is no difference between these two questions. There's really no distinction between the kind of wisdom that we display in our life and the kind of wisdom that we actually possess. Uh, we often imagine that we possess all sorts of wisdom and we're just struggling to bring it to fruition. But biblically speaking, especially according to this passage, the wisdom that you display in your life is the wisdom you possess. There's no distinction. And that's actually really, really important. If the first question uh, pinpoints the, the possession of wisdom, what I possess, and the second question focuses on the display, the production, the fruit, well then we might imagine that there's a legitimate distinction there because we might think, well, I know something that I'm not living. And that could be true. Scripture actually talks about that and has a category for that. But in this passage, there's really no category for that, not because there's not an acknowledgement that you could know something that you're not living, but because that means it's, it's not actually wisdom that you possess. You always live as well as you know. And so if you know something informationally or intellectually, or if you know a truth from the scriptures and you can recognize that is actually from the scriptures and this is a true doctrine, it's true truth, or this is a true command, or there's a true obligation on my life, and it doesn't display itself in your life, then it's actually biblically defined, and according to this passage, it's not a wisdom that you even possess. It's mere knowledge. It's something that's deluding you. It's, you're, in that context, you might have to admit that you are an, a forgetful hearer and not an effectual doer. Look at verse 13, James chapter 3, verse 13. He starts with a question, and um, he says, who among you is wise and understanding? And I think, you know, these questions that James asks are, are, are very penetrating. If you, you notice, this is where we're going, uh, Lord willing, next equipping hour. In James chapter 4, verse 1, he asks two more questions. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? He asks a very pertinent question because he's, he knows where he's going. He wants to draw out a way of thinking in his audience's mind. He did that in chapter 2, if you go backwards, Chapter 2, verse 14, what use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but has no works, can that faith save him? I mean, he's very fond of asking these really, really penetrating questions. And here in chapter 3, verse 13, his penetrating question is simply, who's wise in understanding? Now, he's already talked about the claim to faith, the claim to have faith, the claim to be saved, the claim to be able to be somebody who is trusting God, who believes God's purposes and promises. And, you know, he talks about in chapter 2 that your claim to faith is null and void if it's not demonstrated by, by fruit, by, by works. And there's something quite similar here in chapter 3, verse 13, when he asks the question, who among you is wise in understanding? He's asking a question that is, is a question that the audience needs to be answering, and he explains the answer in 13b by simply saying, let him show his good behavior, by his good behavior, his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. That's a really helpful answer, because when you step back and look at the question and answer together, okay, who's wise and, among, uh, wise and understanding among us? And if we kind of took a sampling here, if I asked you for a show of hands, who's wise and, 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 and understanding? Okay, show of hands. And all, everybody who thinks that they're wise and understanding puts their hands up. And, you know, then you know how that goes. It's like, oh, yeah, he thinks he's wise and understanding. But the fact that you raise your hand means you're not wise and understanding. Well, that's not, that's not what he's asking here. He's, he, you know, somebody, somebody has to be wise and understanding. Christians ought to be wise and understanding. The question is, who is that person who is wise and understanding? And the answer is not, let him who believes he is wise and understanding, let him say so. <laughs> it's let him show it. The proof of wisdom and the proof of understanding 
Uh, and wisdom in the, in the Hebrew context would just be, uh, you know, the practical application of, of truth. It's the ability to live out the truth. And understanding is a, is a, is, is a, a real an intellectual skill, a specialized knowledge. And in this context, the wisdom is the wisdom of the truth applied to one's life. The understanding is very similar. It's the, the, the knowledge of the truth and, and a specialized knowledge. The demonstration of that is not found in the claim. It's found in the life. How do you know if you're wise and understanding. And so, again, this is not a rhetorical question. Who among you is wise and understanding? No one. <laughs> In fact, some of the commentators I read, it's interesting, sometimes you get to these texts like this, and it's easy to kind of miss the real thrust of James 3, verses 13 to 18, if it just becomes a very quick evangelistic text. Who's wise and understanding? Well, no one. Thanks be to Christ who becomes our wisdom, and we have the gospel, and so we trust him. And, not, and they kind of go off to, the, you know, off to the races, and, and that's not the point. A believer, a true child of God, ought to have wisdom and understanding displayed in his life. So the better way to start in understanding this paragraph is, is remembering that as we work through these paragraphs, through these sections of James, each one of these are, are tests of a living faith. And so it's, it's easy to claim to be a Christian. It's, it's, it's one thing to claim it. It's another thing to, to demonstrate it by your, by your fruit. It's one thing to claim to have wisdom and understanding. And it's another thing to display it, according to 13b, by your good behavior in deeds. The gentleness of wisdom, the meekness of wisdom. And so don't think of this as a mere hypothetical Think of this as an actual reality. There are, on the face of this planet, currently, individuals who are wise and understanding. And how you would know them is not because of the claim, but because of their life. And so we look at the fruit. We look at the life. The, the issue is the display, the demonstration. And so that's why in the word, let him show by his good behaviors, his deeds. That's the answer to the question. That's why I titled this The Display of Two Wisdoms. If you look at your life, you're going to see one of two types of wisdom on display. There are only two operative principles in dis on display in someone's life. It's either a wisdom that is categorized as earthly and merely a natural wisdom. It's just what you would have naturally, apart from the grace of God, apart from special revelation, or there is a wisdom that is given by God, it's divine, it's supernatural, it's profoundly health-giving, and profoundly sanctifying. And those are the two types of wisdom that he's going to describe, and your, your life is going to show one or the other. So, in verse 13, as he asks this question, we realize that he's kind of dealing with some of the claims that the uh, audience would be prone to make. Well, I'm wise in understanding. And uh, he says, no, let's just, let's just look at the life. And it's interesting. There, there's, there is a, the, the claim to have the wisdom is not the display of the wisdom, right? We understand that. The, the, the claim to have wisdom is not the display of the wisdom. In fact, in 13b, it's important that not only is he showing it by means of good behavior, so the, the good behavior is the means of how this would be demonstrated, but what he's actually showing is the deeds, the actual deeds. It's the actual action. It's the actual fruit. And this is so important of a test for asking the question whether I'm saved, especially in in our context, where it seems like everything is going the, the direction at times in this hyper-reformed uh, presumption on positional sanctification and our judicial justification, the, the real question is, is well, it, does your life actually demonstrate divine wisdom by your deeds? And then notice this very helpful modifier the prepositional phrase, in the gentleness of wisdom, or in the meekness of wisdom. And this is the kind of deed that is displayed where 
It's the difference between somebody who has a lot of knowledge and they make some profound claims. And they can articulate high and lofty things versus the meekness of wisdom, or as the NES has it, the gentleness of wisdom. And meekness is power under control. It's, it doesn't adorn itself. It doesn't draw attention to itself. It's simply, rather than talking about itself, rather than displaying itself in perhaps a fashion that would actually be easier, namely to talk about it, it actually just displays it in deeds that are performed in the gentleness of in the meekness of wisdom, in a way that's not even self-glorifying, self-promoting, or self-highlighting. It's just simply, here are deeds that are the fruit that could only have come there because of wisdom and understanding. That's the question, that's the test that James sets up. Now, let's look at this. In verse 14 through 16, James starts to describe wisdom Uh, from below, and in verse 17 and 18, he describes wisdom from above. So he basically says, look, it's it's either wisdom or wisdom. (laughs) Which one is it? And in the first three verses, uh, well, first three, 14 to 16, uh, it's wisdom from below, and the second, the last two are wisdom from above. So he's he's comparing and contrasting two different types of wisdom. And ultimately, at the outset, it's important to remember that James is talking about tests of a living faith. So the question really is, if my life is characterized by verses 14 to 16, then I, I have no grounds to even imagine I'm a believer. My faith is being exposed if the deeds of my life are not being performed in the gentleness of wisdom, but are actually matching verses 14 to 16. My profession is suspect at best, if not empty. And then in verses 17 to 18, he's describing this wisdom from above. If we look at our lives and our lives, the actual production of our life, how we live, if it's actually characterized by verse 17 and 18, imperfectly, but nevertheless, that seems to be what we see is God's producing in our lives. That gives encouragement to the believer to say, wow, look at, the, look at what the Lord's producing in my life. There, there's things here that are not natural to me as, a, as an innate human being. There are things here that would be descriptive of wisdom from above, and I'm seeing it on display in my life. This is incredible. This is encouraging. So the believer can look at this passage and see the contrast of the display of two different types of wisdom. And when he compares the truth and uses the, uses the truth as a template to compare to his life, and his life lines up with the wisdom from above, that becomes encouragement to know that I'm not deceiving myself because I've just been given a test from God that's an infallible test. And if that's what my life looks like to some degree, I find great encouragement to know that this is a wisdom from above that's working in my life. It's operative. It's fruitful. Let's look at this. Verse 14. He starts to say, But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. Here's what I want to do. I just want to look, I want to walk through this section on wisdom from below, natural wisdom, earthly wisdom, and shockingly enough, as he says in verse 15, demonic wisdom. And as we look look at these descriptors and look at the fruit and what it's marked by, um, I want to just highlight some of those things and bring bring them to us in kind of some implicational ways. And we're going to look at the differences between somebody who might claim to have wisdom from above, but might actually be characterized by wisdom from below. First of all, he starts out by using this phrase, bitter jealousy. 
And he compares that to selfish ambition. So obviously these two terms are being used in synonymous fashion. Uh, They're at least compatible. Uh, They do have different connotations, of course. We're going to talk about that in just a second. But it's important to recognize that he highlights bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. And these two descriptors are are absolutely uh, slam dunk uh, manifestations of wisdom from below. Now, as I mentioned before, the question is going to be, does this characterize our lives, our life? Uh, because, of, you know, any Christian who's reading this, we, we know we have not arrived. We know we are not glorified. So the question isn't, did I see selfish ambition on Tuesday morning? <laughs> the question is, does this characterize my life? Is this the driving motive in my life? Because if bitter jealousy or selfish ambition are the consuming motive of your life, then that suddenly your, 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 call, your profession of faith becomes suspect. So let's take them one at a time. First of all, bitter jealousy. The, 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 the adjective bitter here is a word that uh, actually comes over to um, English. We have an acid called picric acid. And um, picric acid is, is extremely explosive. It's interesting. I, was, um, I don't even remember where I came across this story, but I remember uh, reading about in, in 1917, so World War I. Uh, in world, the era, world War I era, but this is, this is not on the continent, this is actually in, a, in North America, in Nova Scotia, there was a famous explosion called the Halifax Explosion. On December 6, 1917, the French freighter SS Mont Blanc was full of 2,925 tons of explosives and barrels full of benzyl and picric acid for the war effort. Picric acid is so explosive that you can use it for explosives and for de- some of the detonations that they were doing. It collided in a bay uh, with the Norwegian SS Emo, and the, that ship was carrying Belgian relief supplies, but it had been held up for several days in the harbor. And so apparently the Norwegian ship, the Emo, the captain on the Emo was angry uh, because he'd been delayed and so he just goes out to sea without the harbor master's permission. So it's kind of like taking off without air traffic control telling you it's your turn. He's just like, I'm out of here, tired of this. And so he starts making a beeline for the ocean at the end of the bay. When the two boats collided, the SS Mont Blanc caught fire. And then 20 minutes later at 9.04 a.m., the boat exploded. And what was fascinating about this is the, the absolute devastation um, nearly every structure within a half mile radius was obliterated, and um, there was an ensuing tsunami that washed up in the bay and hit the town, and an estimated 2,000 people were killed and 9,000 were injured. And this is a, an incredible display of the danger and the damage caused by bitterness. And that's just the first word. It gets worse. <laughs> bitter jealousy. So we take the idea of bitterness, and of course we understand what bitterness is. I kind of described its effect. Bitterness, just by nature, is when you, you, when you are embittered, you are holding grudges. There is hatred, hostility, frustration, animosity, uh, because you're not getting what you want. So you take that adjective, and with all of those disastrous effects, and now James attaches that adjective to the noun jealousy. And the second word jealousy is a word that means zeal or passion or ardor. Ardor is a good word. We don't use it that much. Ardor is kind of like a drive. There's like this insatiable drive, a get after itness. Oh, I just created that. I don't know if get after itness is a word, but throw in some hyphens. I'm sure we can create a word there. And so it's actually, uh, it can go either way. It's positive and negative. It's not always a negative. There's a positive sense to this word, and it's used in context where it could be used of some sort of white-hot devotion, a a diligence, a zeal, a passion. And especially ardor, I think, is almost always, and usually it's used in a positive context, although it's fading out of the English language. There's also a negative context, and that's exactly what we have here. And this word, when it's used in a negative context, it can, it's used more along the lines of, and here's the textbook definition in a, in a negative context, intense negative feelings over another's achievements or over their success. And in that kind of context, it's translated jealousy and envy. Bitter jealousy. Bitter envy. 
It's a, it's a bitterness that's explosive because it's jealous, it's envious of someone else. Uh, it's envious of what someone else has or what someone else gets or someone else's ability or someone else's gifts. And so here, when we see this on display, we know for sure that was not produced by wisdom from above. That's produced by wisdom from below. But if you have bitter jealousy and, now this, the second term here, the second um, idea is just one word, and it's translated with two words in English, selfish ambition. Selfish ambition is an interesting word. Um, it, it's actually, it's only, it's, it's only found in Aristotle before the New Testament. Um, he uses it in a way that's it's self, it's a self-seeking pursuit of political office by unfair means. And so if he's using it to describe somebody trying to m- move up in, in rank and, and make a, get a political advantage, he, he would use this word. And um, it's sometimes been suggested in New Testament uh, era to be used for the, for the idea of strife and contentiousness. And that's certainly connected, if not directly involved in the idea of the word here. But it's interesting that... Um, it really does go well with both selfish ambition and the strife involved. And in fact, I do believe that there has to be an emphasis on the selfish ambition simply for the, for the fact that in lists like in, and you don't, have to, you don't have to look these up, we're not going to look here for the sake of time, but in, in a couple examples in the New Testament, Galatians 5.20 and 2 Corinthians 12.20, both of those lists, they're, they're vice lists, you know, uh, 2 Corinthians 12 talking about Paul's experience in ministry, Galatians 5 talking about the fruit of the flesh, um, 520 is talking about the fruit of the flesh, and then he goes on to talk about the fruit of the Spirit. In both of those lists, this word is actually used in a distinct way, it seems, from a synonym that would mean strife. And so I, I do believe it's, it's, it's going to be important to recognize that this word does have the idea, as it always had, going all the way back to Aristotle, the idea of selfish ambition, self-pursuit, self, selfish gain, And so here in verse 14, he starts with these two concepts. On the condition that you have bitter jealousy, bitter envy, and selfish ambition. And you can include the rivalry and strife that would go with it, but let's just, I think selfish ambition is is much preferable here. If you have these, and where would you have them? In your heart. In your heart. I mean, that doesn't even need to be preached, it's, but it's so important to be emphasized. He's, he's talking about looking at the heart and looking at the inner man and looking at the soul because it's quite possible that somebody's external life could have an incredible appearance of calm and an incredible appearance of peace, but on the inside, in the heart, could still be full of bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. If these things are in your heart, verse 14b says, well then don't be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This is an important, this is an important um, phrase. What does it mean to be arrogant and lie against the truth? How would you be lying against the truth? Just because you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, does that mean you're lying against the truth? Well, remember, the whole context is the test of a, of a profession of faith. So how do I know that my profession of faith is actually legitimate or, or is it null and void? So the point being, there is a profession being made. A, a genuine pagan who's never even read the Bible, who's selfishly ambitious, he's not lying against the truth. But a person who professes to be a Christian, whose life is characterized by wisdom from below, and in their heart is ruling this principle of bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, they are arrogant and they are lying against the truth. The claim is to say, I have wisdom from God, I know the truth, I believe the gospel, I am Christ's personal possession, but then their life is characterized by bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. They're lying. This is a false claim. The lie is claiming to have wisdom while it's not being demonstrated in one's life, starting with in one's heart. And so you think about this, 
This is an incredibly penetrating point to bring home here in verse 14. It's much easier to claim to know something than it is to live it. It's much easier to talk about the truth and to talk about humility than it is to live it. It's easier to talk about killing sin, putting it to death, amputating and crucifying selfish ambition. It's a lot easier to talk about than it is to do. We could even start applying this to virtually every area that the scriptures talk about. It's easier to talk about parenting than to parent. It's easier to talk about marriage than to have a marriage that glorifies and honors the Lord. It's easier to talk about atonement rather than to actually emulate the mindset of Christ to condescend, described in Philippians 2, that become, must become our mindset. These things are just so much easier than the display of them. Talking about them are easier than the display. And what happens is, when we talk about those things, when we make those kind of claims, if it happens in a life that is characterized by bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, then that life, that person needs to recognize they are arrogant and they're lying against the truth. I've asked myself this question a lot. We, we get to study the Bible. We get to study God's word. Infallible testimony of the glories of the incomparable God. And I, I ask myself, how, how, do I, how can I study this book and then still turn right around and see and naturally, naturally, let me just say it that way, I can turn right around and see the, the naturally how prone I am to pride. To say that I'm studying the glory of God, that I worship God, that I'm impressed with who he is in his being, but then to look at my life if I see fruit that would be proud, impressed with self, well, then that would be a display of arrogance and a lie against the truth. I have to conclude I must not have been studying the truth because the fruit that I'm seeing is self-promotion, self-aggrandizement, bitter jealousy, selfish ambition. That's inconsistent with the truth. And that's why he says that in verse 14b, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. Instead, verse 15, this is this wisdom is that which does not come down from above, but it's earthly, natural, and demonic. Earthly makes sense. It pertains to this earth. It pertains to this life. It's just the kind of wisdom that you get by googling wisdom. <laughs> Read 10 articles, and you're going to get probably, most likely, at least 9 out of 10, if not 10 out of 10, are going to be earthly wisdom. And it just pertains to this life. It's tied to this earth, this world. It's worldly wisdom. Natural pertains to your natural life. It's your natural ability, your natural being. It's who you are apart from Christ. You could even say, perhaps, fleshly, which wouldn't be necessarily the right translation, but that's the right idea. It's the right concept. Fleshly. And the third description is demonic. You think, oh, man, James, are you serious? Like, are, are you just, is that like overspeak? Seriously? Like, what, what is this? Just like an exclamation point? Like, I'm running out of stuff to describe it. Let me get really bad. Demonic. Ooh. Is this, is this an overspeak? Absolutely not. There's no overspeak here. The word is exactly right. It is perfect. And we need to think about this for a second. If you are operating according to wisdom from below, it is nothing more than worldly. It's nothing more than carnal. It is nothing more than demonic or satanic. Why the word demonic? Think about demonic wisdom. And regardless of what you do with like an Isaiah 14 or Ezekiel 28, you think about those descriptions um, of Satan's self-promotion and self-aggrandizement, we know conclusively, inarguably, we know that the wisdom of Satan 
can be described in the words of Jesus from Matthew chapter 16 as centered on self. Remember when Peter rebukes Jesus? He rebukes Jesus and Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Again, that's not over speaky either. That's not just, uh, I, I want to say something really, really inflammatory. He calls him Satan because he says, for you are setting your mind on the things of man, not on the things of God. And so being man-centered or self-centered is absolutely like the essential, the sine non of demonic wisdom. And so it's very appropriate that James calls it earthly, natural, demonic. Three synonyms describing wisdom from below that we have naturally. Verse 16 kind of describes the effect. So he builds on what he said already and takes it to its fruit. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, wherever these things occur in the heart, and especially when he's, what he's describing here is where these things would reign, when these things are pervasive in the heart, look at what happens. There is disorder and every evil thing. The word disorder, um, we've already, we already saw this last week, actually. In verse 8, if you go back to verse 8, it, it, talking of the tongue, James writes this, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. Well, that word restless is our word here in verse 16, disorder. And in fact, we, we also saw it in chapter 1, verse 8. If you go back there for a second, go back a couple pages. James chapter 1, verse 8 it's talking about the man who needs to ask for wisdom. He should ask with faith. Um, but the man that expects in verse 7 that he will receive something from the Lord, if he doesn't expect that, verse 8 says he is a double-minded man. And here it is, unstable in all his ways. So we've already seen it in, in the NAS. We've seen it unstable. We've seen it um, restless. And now here we see it disordered. And the word is literally, it's a, it's a denial of a state of being or a state of character. So it's not the state of being. It's not the state of character. It's, it's not standing upon something. It's not staying put here where it becomes characteristic of one's life. It's not the characteristic. It's, it's the, it has to do with the instability because it's not the pattern. So this is a, a freneticness. This is a, a disorder. If it's used w with circumstances, it's translated disturbance or tumult. If it's used with regard to established authority, it's translated disorder or unruliness. And this is an individual who, who is unstable. And so where the person is characterized by jealousness and selfish ambition, then in his life, you know what you're going to see? You're going to see disorder, instability, tumult, restlessness. Proverbs 24, 21b says, do not associate with those who are given to change. Verse 22 says, for their calamity will rise suddenly, and who knows the ruin that comes from both of them? Don't associate with those who are given to change. The people whose, whose lives, there's a, it's lacking stability, it's lacking a singular direction, it's frenetic, it's running in all areas and going in all directions. That's a mark of jealousy and selfish ambition. It's, it's marked by... The, fruit, the life will be marked by disorder and every evil thing. And so here, by saying every evil thing, James is saying there's really no limit to where this will lead. There is no such thing as compartmentalization. You, you, can't, you can't possibly compartmentalize your spiritual life and imagine that you can have selfish ambition and bitter jealousy reigning in your heart and you can keep it in a box well, I've got selfish ambition, and I've got, uh, th this is kind of over here in this area, but fortunately I've got these other eight areas of my life that are all, you know, really, really sound. It, you can't compartmentalize this. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not like the, the school lunch tray. I had a school lunch tray that was very compartmentalized. It's like, here's where this goes, here's where this goes, here's where, it's all got the little imprint. It's more like the plate at Thanksgiving. You cannot possibly keep those foods from mixing, you know, unless you have such small portions that it's just not even worth your trip back, you know? It's just like, load that thing up, it gets mixed, okay. That's a, that's, that's a picture of sin. You, you can't possibly contain it. We, um... We get to verse 16, and I think one of the ways that I like to picture this, the way, the way that's, that's helpful is 
I picture uh, a rope. I used to work at a dock, and um, when I was in college, I got a summer job working at a, working at a dock. And, and when we would when we would uh, string up new ropes on the boats, we would uh, you know cut the rope. And there was a massive industrial spool of rope, and we would just cut it wherever we needed it for each particular boat that we were working on. And then we had a like a latex dip, and it was like this you know you know sealed so that it wouldn't dry out. And you would just quickly open it, dip the rope in there, and then seal it back up so that it doesn't dry out. But then the rope would actually dry, and so it becomes like this, you know, glued end, kind of like the equivalent of singeing the, uh, you know, ends of a shoelace or whatever or a string. And so it keeps it from just unraveling and fraying in every area. And so if you pulled up a rope that had been underwater for two years, of course it's just unraveled and it's just like a mess. And you, you could see an old rope because you would just recognize it's not even braided anymore. Like the last four feet of it are totally undone. It's going in every direction. It's just absolutely out of control. And, and, and that's the picture that comes to my mind sometimes when I think of this verse. Where there's jealousy and selfish ambition, you know what? The whole life is going to be out of control. It's going to be frayed at the ends. It's not something you can possibly compartmentalize. You can't put a lid on it. It's going to affect everything. And this is the display, this is the display of wisdom from below. Now, if somebody who's following Christ, their life is not perfect. If somebody's following Christ and they say they're perfect, well, we know they're a liar, First John says. So the question is not perfection, but the question certainly is, is my life falling apart in every area? Is it frayed at the ends? Is my life, is, is there really just nothing that I can even, am I seeing power over the, the sins that, are, that would be the evidence of an, of an internal jealousy and an internal selfish ambition? Let's quickly look at wisdom from above. Here's a radical transition. In verse 17, he says, but, and that's an important transition because he contrasts wisdom from below with this, wisdom from above. And notice what he does. In verse 17, he's going to give us a bunch of descriptions. And the first one is, is actually put preeminently first, and then he just says then. So first, pure, and then dot, dot, dot. And he works all the way through seven more descriptions in verse 17 that describe wisdom from above. And so I'm going to very quickly kind of give you some quick comments on each of these words. But before we do that, I just want you to know, when, when he says first pure, I don't believe that he's saying that's necessarily the starting point of it all, as if it causes the other ones. And you could probably, you know, go to other texts of scripture and show how some of these things flow out of holiness, and that's certainly true. But I think he's putting preeminent on it in the sense this is the most first and foremost descriptor of wisdom from above. This should be the sin qua non of a person who's characterized by wisdom from above. And so if you even find other things that could pertain to it, this is critical, is purity. Wisdom from above is, first of all, pure. Uh, the word pure means chaste, holy. If it's used of persons, it can be undefiled, uh, pure from blood, or guiltless, pure and upright. Listen to the biblical usage. Psalm 12, Psalm 12, 6, the psalmist says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace on earth, refined seven times. Picturing the word of God so pure, it's as if you refined something, you smelted it down, you melted it down seven times, and each time you melted it down, you remove any dross of a, de- of a metal or an impurity of a different density than the silver, and you did that seven times over. That is pure. And he says that's, that's getting close to the level of purity of God's word. There's nothing impure. There's no dross in God's word. There's nothing that needs to be skimmed off the top. Absolutely pure. Um, the judgments, uh, sorry, Psalm 19, verse 9. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. Proverbs 20, verse 9. Who can say, I have cleansed my heart. I am pure from my sin. And this, is, this cleansing is only by means of wisdom from above, and, and it's actually unfinished in this life. But... It's an interesting verse, nevertheless, because nobody can say in this life, I am pure from my sin, but purity must be characterizing the life in a general sense, not in a perfect sense. 
Uh, I'll skip some of these for the sake of time, but let me just go ahead and give you the last one here. 1 John 3, 3. John wrote, And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Listen, holy living is the primary test of wisdom from above. How do you evaluate your faith? Well, look at your life. Does it produce holiness and purity? Does your devotion to the Lord keep you unstained from the world? I mean, James already said that. This is pure and undefiled religion, to keep oneself unstained from the world. Ask yourself, is your heart consecrated to the Lord? Is your heart, are you seeing actual progress? Not, not, just, not just do we desire. I mean, we can even deceive ourselves with what we think is a desire. If I said, do you desire to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's great. You, should, you must desire. If you don't desire that, then that obviously proves you are, you're operating according to wisdom from below. But that's not enough. Because we can even deceive ourselves by saying, yeah, I really desire that. And I've been desire, desiring that for 30 years. But I actually don't love the Lord any more than I did 30 years ago. The question is, what's being displayed by your life? But I don't want to just say, do you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Because, obviously, we would be a liar to say yes. So the question is, are you seeing a love for the Lord with your heart, soul, mind, and strength in an increasing fashion? Here's the way you can think about it. Is your mind increasingly pure? Is your heart motive increasingly pure? Are you increasingly sensitive to impure motives, selfish motives about why you do what you do or say what you say or conduct yourselves in any relationship? Then James moves on to the seven other traits. And these aren't numbered, they're just listed. And so um, these certainly seem to be in some fashion a, a secondary to the primary emphasis on holiness or purity. Let's just take them one at a time. Peaceable. Peaceable. This pertains to being conducive to a harmonious relationship. This is somebody who is prone toward peace. They, are, they have the ability to produce peace. They are a peacemaker, in the words of Jesus, in the Beatitudes. Uh, this is the, where we get our word irenic, the, the original word, and, uh, which is defined as aiming at or aiming toward or aiming at peace. You're a peaceable person. Listen to this example in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterward, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. There's a, righteousness, there's a righteous quality of the person's life that tends toward peace, the peaceable fruit. Um, second, or third, third is uh, gentle. Gentle in the NES. It's just, it means somebody who's not insisting on every right of, of the letter of, or law or custom, they're yielding, they're, they're gentle, they're kind, they're courteous, they're tolerant. And the morphology of this word is interesting. It's actually something that is, stands upon yieldedness. It stands upon yieldedness. Um, well, there's several examples of this. I, I'll, I'll skip them for the sake of time, but... Think about this implication. If wisdom from above is characterized by gentleness, it might be helpful to even think about the opposite for a second. The opposite would be nagging, nitpicking, looking for unimportant errors or faults to criticize or confront. Wisdom from above produces this kind of gentle forbearance or moderation. It's a kindness a tendency toward peaceability, its propensity to forgive. Ask yourself this. Is your marriage characterized by toleration, forbearance, tendency toward quickly forgiving your spouse? Do your interactions with your spouse tend toward peace or conflict? Which one? Is your demeanor toward your spouse, is it characterized by an adaptability to your spouse's circumstances? Do you defer? 
Do you prefer your spouse? Next, James says it's reasonable. Reasonable. Then he has footnote says willing to yield, which is a great note. It, reasonable means compliant, obedient, ready to obey. The idea is, the, 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 the morphology of the word means well persuaded. You're persuaded by good. And so this is somebody who's, who's not stubborn. They're not holding to their position and they're just like refuse to give in. They're actually easily persuaded when it's a true persuasion, when they're, they're persuaded by truth. And so they're open to reason. They're open to consider someone else's perspective. They're open, they're, 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 you know, they're honestly quite secure uh, because they are operating according to wisdom from above. So what are they hiding? They have nothing to hide. They don't play their cards close to their chest. They're totally transparent. Oh, this is what I was thinking. This is what I said that. This is, yeah. Oh, you know what? That's actually a good point. That is a better way to think about it. You're, you're easily persuaded because you're secure because you're building, you're building your life on wisdom from above. So you have nothing to hide. So you would be persuaded easily when truth is being spoken. That's somebody who's compliant, reasonable. Next, James says, full of mercy and good fruits. Full of mercy and good fruits. Uh, mercy is compassion, pity, and kindness. Mercy is the desire of God. I, desire, I delight in mercy rather than sacrifice. And mercy is like God because all of us have disobeyed. If God were like us, he would have given up on all of us long ago, but he is merciful. And so the implication here is you're never more like God than when you show mercy to someone who has wronged you or has personally offended you or was motivated by any selfish motive that ended up complicating your life. Wisdom from above would show mercy. But full of mercy and full of good fruits. I mean, this is a life that is uh, so full of good fruit, it's so light, it's so salty, it's so distinct from the world that the unbelievers would look at your life and they would glorify God on the day of visitation because of your deeds. First uh, Peter chapter two verses nine through through twelve say. Next, James says unwavering. Unwavering. It, it pertains to not being uncertain. You're you're unwavering. The wisdom from above is it's. It's revealed from God. It's given to us clearly in his word. So the person who's operating according to wisdom from above, they don't waver. A person who's operating according to bitterness, envy, selfish ambition, of course, they are totally unstable because guess what happens? If I'm trying to promote myself, please myself, gratify myself, my desires and what suits me is so fickle, I change so quickly, and my circumstances change almost as quickly. I'm going to be aiming at different things in every different nanosecond of my existence. But the person who's driven and standing on wisdom from above, their life is stable because truth doesn't change. So their life is just straight at it. Right there in that rut, wisdom from above. And the rut's not a, good, not a bad thing in this context. Just poof, singularly focused, unwavering. That's a, that's a sign of wisdom from from above. And then finally, without hypocrisy. Without hypocrisy. Not hypocritical. There's no pretense. There's no pretext. There's no covering. There's no disguise. There's no camouflage. There's no mask. The person who's operating according to wisdom from above, they, they have nothing to hide. So there's no hypocrisy. They're not saying something that they don't live. They're living what they say. Now, again, I get it. As a, especially, I get it as a, as a preacher. I get it as a dad. I mean, we are constantly opening up the scriptures and saying things from the Bible that we have not attained to. We're always speaking better than we live. And so that, that's, not, that's not what he's talking about with hypocrisy here. Hypocrisy would be to claim something like, I am righteous and I do this perfectly. That's just a flat out lie. Or, hey, you've got to live this way, but then secretly, I don't live that way. And so I understand there's, there's, there's a, like a lowercase hypocrisy that we talk about when we say, like, I'm preaching this text, and I've never perfectly modeled or lived out wisdom from above, but by God's grace, as I've studied this, I'm, I'm like, wow, there's, there's, there's something in my life that I, I, I'm pretty sure John Anderson can't take the credit for. There's some wisdom from above in, in operative principle here. This is incredible. So we're always speaking beyond what we um, live, but the 
Hypocrisy that would be condemning is a gross hypocrisy that would just say, here's what I'm telling you, and I don't live that way. That's, that, that, that never characterizes wisdom from above. So he concludes in verse 18, the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And you can see the word is sown into the heart and it produces a righteousness um, that produces peaceability. And so the person who's operating according to wisdom from above is, is a peaceable person and their life is going to be marked not by wrangling, not by rivalry, not by competing with others, but by peace with others, tranquility, tolerance, deference, love, sacrifice. That's the fruit. In the remaining few minutes, I want to just step back for a second, and I want to think specifically about this idea that James says about claiming to be wise, but actually not modeling it. There are a few ways I think that we as Christians can sometimes lie against the truth in our claim to have wisdom. And I listed out three, and I think I can just list them for you here. I don't know if I can develop them. I'll see how, how much we can do here in a minute or two. Number one, cheap talk. Sometimes we claim to have wisdom but we actually are just engaging in cheap talk. This is the kind of, it's what we talked about in verses 13 and 14. It's just claiming to have wisdom, but it doesn't actually produce anything. And so, you know, I remember uh, a friend who was radically saved, and they had just finished a, a jail sentence, and they were 19 years old, and they gave me a b copy of a book that they had written on parenting. And um, they weren't a parent. They weren't married. But they had to finish their, their jail sentence. And it's so funny, because this, this is a dear friend of mine, and we laugh about it to this day. He's just like, he's like, hey, have you ever read my parenting book? And he kind of just chuckles, because he, <laughs> he wanted me to read it. And I was just like, oh, yeah, I'll get to it at some point, you know. And <laughs> I never still haven't read it. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's just interesting. It's just easier to talk about parenting than to parent. And it's easier to talk about marriage than to be married. And so, simply put, it's easier to talk about the Bible than it is to live the Bible. And so that's one of the most indicting ways, the most obvious ways that Christians or professing Christians can lie against the truth is by making claims about what they know from the Bible that are empty of a life that would live it. There's nothing wrong with speaking the Bible. We, we must speak the Bible. It's everything wrong is speaking it without living it. Number two, if number one is cheap talk, number two is pious talk, Sometimes this form is it's particularly ironic because we find ways sometimes of speaking in a way that has the appearance of humility. We, we kind of find ways of speaking that makes it look like we have wisdom from above, but it might actually be wisdom from below. Uh, Postmodern uh, interpreters would do this when they say, after interpreting the Bible, this is my interpretation, but hey, you know, I wouldn't know. I mean, who am I? I, I, I wouldn't be so arrogant to imagine that I could know what the right interpretation is when smarter men have disagreed Carnal teachers do this. Carnal, carnal Bible teachers do this. 1 Timothy 1, 3 through 7 describes that's going to be a characteristic of those who desire to be experts in the law, but they're arrogantly making assertions about things they don't understand. I remember one time a, in, a, in a, an academic environment, a scholar standing up, waxing eloquent about some theory he had about the technical terms for the Messiah and the Aramaic Targums. He gets to the end of a one-hour lecture and says, but I don't know. I mean, it could all just be a bunch of bunk. That's just my, this is just my theory. I don't know. Take it or leave it. Might not even be right. I remember thinking, it might not even be right. Then why are you speaking right now? Why are you talking? Perhaps closer to the heartbeat of James 3, 13 and following would be a form of pious talk that, that actually... Create, sometimes we have human conventions where we create the idea or the sense of humility rather than displaying humility. Uh, we might say, oh, this is only my opinion. And uh, who am I to be speaking right now? And then we go ahead and <laughs> talk. And then we speak in a self-deprecating or belittling way. And sometimes that becomes a banner for humility. It's a banner of humility that we wave to show everyone how humble we are. 
And in this instance, the display of wisdom would be shown by dropping a man-made convention and by not speaking if humility would not speak. And so sometimes we have these humble taglines. It's a phrase or a catchword that we use to, to, to show how wise we are and to show how humble we are. And, you know, the display here of humility or the display of wisdom in that kind of context would not be putting a tagline on the front of it. It would be remaining silent. If we're speaking in a context where we need to be speaking truth, if it's at home or at work or at church or in a conversation with a dear friend, and we're convinced, we're not convinced that the uh, content that we're saying is positively edifying, then don't throw a humble tagline on it. Don't say it. Don't sanctify the pride that sometimes would speak something that actually comes from our own wisdom um, by making it sound pious and humble. Third category is no talk. <laughs> Cheap talk, pious talk, no talk. Sometimes people's silence, honestly, is the fruit of pride. And I know as soon as I say this, that sounds like the opposite of the second point. And the manifestation is quite opposite, but it's actually still the same heart. There is a way where our pride will promote silence because we might camouflage our silence as, a, um, as actual display of humility, but there's times where we need to speak truth and there's times where we might be quiet because of fear of what people might perceive of us, and we're concerned about people's opinion. And so saying silent might be less costly to our fear of man than speaking truth, which might be offensive. The inner monologue here might be something like, better to keep my mouth closed to conceal folly rather than to speak it and remove all doubt. And so we remain silent. And this display of humility might actually, the, the display of humility here might actually be speaking truth that we know to be true and killing the thought of what people think of us. That might be the actual way forward there. And I, I'll never forget when I remember hearing MacArthur one time talking about a Q&A and somebody asked him about something that was very controversial and, and the question was, do you, do you care about what people think? And he said, do I care about what people think? Of course. He said it so boldly, it shocked me. And then of course he said, of course I don't care what they think about me, but I care tremendously about what they think about God and his truth. And so sometimes our silence can even be a manifestation of wisdom from below. But hopefully that's helpful, just thinking about some of the ways where we could make claims that might be exposed by our lives. But the question is, believer, professing believer, does our life characterize wisdom from below or wisdom from above? Lord, thank you so much for this text and for its clarity. Every week, Lord, your, these James passages are just uh, relentlessly penetrating. It's such a punchy, penetrating epistle, and I pray, Lord, that as we keep studying this, that it would produce fruit and that we would be equipped with discernment, first and foremost, about our own hearts, about the operative principle of wisdom, that we would even understand there is no difference between the wisdom we possess and the wisdom we display. They are one and the same. Whatever we display, that is our wisdom. And so, Lord, give us clarity, and I pray that it would produce assurance and for any who, who, for whom this text exposes their life as one that's characterized by wisdom from below, I pray that they would repent and they would find wisdom from you in Christ, in Christ alone. I pray that they would recognize that they will, every time, uh, if you gave them a thousand lives and they lived as wisely as they could, they would live with natural, earthly, and demonic wisdom every single time. And only by your grace can we can we see something different? But Lord, we know that when we profess to have faith, it actually must be verified by some display of wisdom from above, that our lives would be different and distinct, salty, pure, and holy. In your name we pray. Amen.